Worldwide Exchange is now a podcast. I'm Brian Sullivan. Join me as we hit the biggest money stories from around the world, breaking down the risks and rewards of global trade, the news you need to know with real world actionable advice, and even a little fun and unique content you won't get anywhere else, like the most random but interesting thing you'll hear all day. Subscribe to the Worldwide Exchange podcast today. I'm Scott Wapner, and you're listening to CNBC's Halftime Report, the podcast, the most profitable hour of the trading day. We record this live weekdays at 12 Eastern. Listen in. All right, Julia, thanks so much. Welcome to the Halftime Report. I'm Scott Wapner, front and center this hour inside today's sell-off with stocks under significant pressure. The big question now, is a bigger and more painful pullback coming? We debate that with the Investment Committee. Joining me for the hour today, Liz Young, Michael Farr, Surat Sethi, Pete Nigerian, and Joe Terranova. Stocks, as you know by now, down sharply. Bond yields down sharply as well. Fears over the fast-spreading Delta variant are intensifying. So, Liz Young, is this the big correction that some have been calling for? Is this the beginning of it? This is certainly a correction. I don't know that I would call it a big correction. And remember how we define correction, that's 10%. I don't know that we're going to get to 10%. I think what the fear is here is that obviously we've got this Delta variant out there. The concern is that we don't have a new solution coming, right? We don't have a new vaccine that's going to come. We don't have a new savior that's going to come in and change the direction of this. So we have to just let it play out. So then now the question is, how long does it play out for? What does that look like? I think it plays out for probably 5% or so. And this is a good opportunity for us to step back realize that we are in transition from rebound to recovery and resize some positions and make sure that you have diversified exposure into the second half of the year. All right. So Joe Terranova, really, it's anything Delta related is is down today, Uh, whether it's the airlines or the cruise lines. You're you're talking substantial losses as well. As I looked earlier, now the market has come off of its worst levels. The Dow, don't forget, was down by more than 800. But airlines and cruise lines Um, almost indiscriminately in in terms of those names, we're down about 7% or so. Energy is bad today. Oil's down. Oil stocks are down. I noticed that you sold Tesla. You you covered, you had XLE puts that you've since covered. Just sort of talk to me about what you're seeing. Give people some um, advice on what they should be thinking about here. Well, Scott, I think energy is a big part of the reason that we are down so significantly. Mike Wilson is correct. This is a series of rolling corrections. The rolling correction is now occurring in crypto assets. It's occurring in uh, meme stocks, and it's occurring specifically in energy. I had highlighted a couple of weeks ago that I was growing concerned after being very bullish on energy equities that we were seeing disparity between the positive price performance of the spot oil, but yet you were seeing energy equities significantly underperform. So I think what you're seeing here unfold, and it will continue to unfold, is a lot of positioning that was heavily placed on the long side in the energy equities market. I think that's coming out. I think that's exactly where that rolling correction currently is. I think you're down 13% here just in the last five days. I don't look for that selling pressure to abate at any point. I got in there. I did buy some puts. Uh, Obviously, I made a a very nice return on those puts, so I covered them. But that does not mean I don't think that energy continues to move lower. And as it relates to Tesla, I timed myself out on that one. I bought that one uh, on June 23rd. It's really gone nowhere while mega cap technology has actually advanced. It should have gone somewhere. So I stepped and moved to the sidelines. I mean, the you know, look, we all have to grapple with the fact the reality is, you know, a a lot of. People who watch, I'm looking at a stock as, as, I'm, as I'm saying this, and I'll tell you about it in just a second. Um, a lot of people who watch our show follow you guys and, and, and gals into um, some of the trades that you talk about. I was thinking, Joe, as I was looking at what's happening in the industrial complex today, for example, um, Honeywell's down nearly 4%. You told us on July 7th, um, so about a week or so mm-hmm. ago, that you had bought it. And I'm wondering how you're thinking about that. And what somebody who may have followed you into what appears to be not a great trade thus far should be thinking about in this kind of market. So I would tell someone that followed me into Honeywell to stay with that trade. Remember, I exited Suncor, ticker symbol SU, to buy Honeywell. I got a nice little pop in Honeywell. It's now pulling back to the entry point. I still like it. I think that there are places within the market, not in energy, 
But I think in industrials and in select financials, you could begin to nibble. And if you haven't nibbled in industrials yet, Honeywell is a perfect quality, strong balance sheet name to do so. Pete, you know, materials, they're on my list today, too, of these cyclical stocks that are having a problem. Um, a viewer writes in, and it's a perfect place to do this. Do you have an update on your Freeport calls? Uh, that's from Scott in Longview, Texas. Yeah. Um, again, you, you own FCX calls. What do you do with those on a day like today? Well, I, I think uh, you actually just have to um, continue to hold those for the day, Scott. But I think the reality is they were inexpensive calls to start with, which is a good thing. And when I say that, I mean a lot of the time I have all kinds of different rules. And John and I talk about this all the time. When you're buying options and you're long, uh, let's say, a call option, if it's over a certain dollar amount, then that becomes an option that if it gets cut in half, we're going to cut and leave. We're wrong on that trade. We missed that trade and everything about it, it's not working, so we want to exit that. Same thing is true, obviously, on the upside. You want to take at least half off if it doubles because you've taken everything off of the table, and now you can make decisions uh, going forward after that. So in a case like this, we've seen a lot of different option paper coming in there, Scott, of late, and, and when we've seen that, obviously, we're going to pounce on that just like any other trade. But when they're less expensive, it gives you a little bit more leeway to kind of hold on. Now, do I think necessarily that it's ready to rebound right away come tomorrow? Absolutely not. But it is, you know, you, we just don't know. So the possibility does exist there. I don't want to sell out of that trade on an inexpensive option and then suddenly see any kind of a rebound for whatever reason and, and then wonder why did I get out. So for now, holding on to that call. I've also got some in Semex, CX. So there's a couple other material space that I'm that I'm getting beat up in a little bit as well. Letter X, the stock, U.S. Steel. I own that. That's not feeling as good. But I've had that for a very long time, and I've been selling calls against that for a very long time. That's what we do with the long stock that I've got. So um, there's a lot of different ways to approach each and every one of these, and I think that's what makes, in Joe's case, he's talking about those puts. That's the beauty of the option market, though, is it gives you a time frame, which is good and bad, but it gives you a time frame in which it's got to produce, and then I also know exactly how much is the most I can lose on a trade is yeah. what I've paid for it. So in Joe's case with the XLE puts, whatever he paid, let's say it was a dollar, that's the most he could lose. But on the other hand, when it goes down like it has, and in this push with oil going from 77 to 71, now down to 67, 68, it, it's a great trade for Joe, and he's able to take that off. He might even roll and have more puts. But it's a smart thing to take that off because he's had great gains. Why not take that off? And if he wants to still be involved, you roll down and you get a little closer to where the stock is trading, or in this case, crude is trading now. Surat, you know, I'm looking at the yields on the 10-year today. 118 was the low. Now, it's, it's bounced a little bit off of that level. Uh, do you think this is part of a larger correction that's happening, or does it just feel more painful at the moment than it is ultimately going to be. Now, I know the Delta variant is assuming a large part of the, the conversation. I should also let you know that New York City just a few moments ago said they're not going to re-up their mask mandate. Let's just put things into perspective, too. Liz talked about the vaccine at the beginning. We don't have another vaccine. The good thing is, is that these vaccines work. We just need more people to take them up and continue to encourage people in some of the lower uh, rate of vaccinated, uh, you know, some of the states with the lower vaccination rates mm -hmm. to get vaccinated. W what do you think, Surat, is coming for the market? I, I think, look, you know, as Liz said, we've had a 5% correction uh, last October. We really haven't had one since then. So when you get days like this, when the market moves 800 points on the, on the Dow, it, it shakes some people up. And then you get, well, what is going to happen to the recovery that we're going to have? your tenures showing, you know, uh, an indication. I'm in the camp that I think we go down five, seven percent. I don't think it's going to be that huge because this this vaccine works. And, and, and the goal here is to get more people vaccinated. And hopefully those who aren't vaccinated uh, aren't going to get as sick as what we saw in the last year. So fundamentals are really strong. I mean, earnings have been really strong. The consumer's got a lot of money. Um, I think going forward, once we get through this earnings season, uh, the, the market's going to recover back again, whether it drops five, seven or, you know, percent, not sure. But I'm sitting here, you know, I like stocks like Morgan Stanley. When the 10-year goes to 1.18 or 1.2, Morgan Stanley just double their dividend. 
They're going to grow at least 10% next year. 60% of their earnings come recurring. And the stock is selling at 12 times earnings. So there are going to be opportunities for companies like a Morgan Stanley, you know, to Joe's point, like the Honeywells, high quality companies that if they keep getting sold off, add them to your portfolio. But I wouldn't sell out of my portfolio at this point. I'm just looking for you know, new opportunities to put some capital to work. Michael Farr, it's good to see you again. It's been a minute. Um, I hope you've been well. Uh, so Dow's down 833 as I look at it right now. How bad is it going to get? Who, who knows? Uh, there's so much cash on the sidelines, Scott. All of these pullbacks have been pretty short-lived, almost in a frustrating way to those of us who are looking to put more capital to work. $4.6 trillion in money market funds, uh, banks returning capital to the Fed because they don't want to impair capital ratios means that we're still in a market and an economy that's awash in cash. That cash is looking opportunistically for these pullbacks. So I tend to think that this one could get thwarted. Could, I'd, I'd love to see that 5 or 7%. I always am looking for bargains. But uh, I think you're also seeing the mercurial, vulnerable nature of markets that have been very dependent on the course of this disease. And let's not forget what's going on in Washington. Whether we get an infrastructure bill or not, those discussions aren't going well right now. And it looks like it could be well late into the fall before there's another sort of a stimulus story to tell. And so where does that leave us? It leaves us an earnings season where numbers are looking very good, but they were expected to look very good. So markets are getting what they expected. The COVID variant is not an expectation. Uh, it's a bit of a headwind. Overall, I think you continue to look for quality. You continue to look for balance sheets. This is when disciplined investors make their money. And I think you've heard that from every member of the investment committee today, looking to be opportunistic, looking to put good money to work in good names. Hey, Joe, what happened to stocks are, are inexpensive to bonds, right? Because stocks are now cheaper and, you know, bond prices are going up. Yields continue to come down. What happened to that argument? We conversation we were just yeah. having last week right i just had this conversation with yeah, gunlock and, uh, who said who said yeah stocks are still at expensive valuations but the only thing keeping them where they are is because they're cheap to bonds well they're cheaper today yeah that they are that's 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 an excellent point and uh certainly we're not having a conversation today about tapering are we uh, that's kind of been removed but uh i think overall scott a lot of this has to do with COVID trends before. You mentioned vaccinations. We talk here domestically about the right things that we could be doing, but this is really about COVID trends outside of the U.S. This is about the Olympics. This is about the news this morning with, with Microsoft and China. So collectively, I, I look at that information and I say to myself, is there a catalyst in front of us that allows us to think that we're going to see some form of a bottom here in the near term for the market? And you have to fall back on earnings. Now, I don't think they line up this week for earnings really works in the favor of the market finding that bottom. I think next week you've got a, a much better potential lineup to see a recovery from earnings. Uh, but some things that I would be watching right here, I would be focused on the Russell, which is approaching its 200-day oh. moving average. It has not done that okay. since October of last Yeah. It has not done that since October of last year. I'm glad you mentioned that. I literally was going to go there next. I, I was going to ask you, uh, I'll ask Liz since you mentioned that, are there things like the small and mid caps, the Russell, that have come down too much that are approaching some technical levels that maybe are off of their worst levels that have been under pressure over the last few weeks that now look more attractive, Liz, than they otherwise might have before? Sure, there, there definitely are. And I mean, full disclosure, I usually am constructive on small caps, so there's no difference in this statement today. But there are things that have pulled back probably too much if you look at the grand scheme of what a recovery usually plays out as in the market. Usually the cyclicals win, usually small caps and mid caps win. And that's something that I would expect to happen over the next few months. And I think another thing I want people to remember that the timing of some of these forces is 
sort of coincidental and probably bringing us down further today. So we've got a period right now where we've hit peak growth, or at least we're assuming that we've hit peak growth, peak earnings, and maybe peak sentiment. So we're transitioning into a time when what does it look like on the other side of that peak? And now we've got this new concern with the Delta variant. So I think some of the fear is going to be overdone in the market. And when fear is overdone in the market, that is a great opportunity to position yourself for what you think should win in the next phase. And that next phase is that recovery phase, not a rebound phase. They're very different. A recovery phase where you see things like cyclicals, you see things like small cap win, and you see yields slowly grind higher. Yeah, I think I'll, the yield move is overdone. I, I also want to note here, you know, speaking of, you know, yields coming way down and whether some in the growth complex become more attractive in that sort of environment. I'm looking at the ARK Innovation Fund, the ARKK. It's gone positive. It's positive now by one half of, of 1%. You've seen some of those high growth, you know, Pete, those high growth, big momentum names, many of which may be tied to so-called stay-at-home trades, the Pelotons of the world, which had been getting a, a, would be getting a lift in in this kind of a, a market, and I look at my screen as we're having the conversation, Peloton's up nearly 7% um, at the very moment, mm -hmm. 117 is where, where that is. And there are a lot of other names, Pete, in that complex that are looking more attractive on a day where you're talking about the Delta variant and you have a sell-off elsewhere and you have a big pullback in bond yields and people looking at some stocks where you can find some significant growth. Well, there's a name that's up a lot right now. So is it time to look at, at those stocks, Pete? Because Kathy Wood herself last week, and I think it was on this network, said that this is a risk off kind of environment. I'm thinking of stocks like Snowflake, Pete, as we revisit um, yep. a, a, a call buy that you had last week on, I'm looking at my list on Tuesday. Yep. What about these names now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and again, Scott, these names, sure, but the, the, the issue here is a lot of the time, I just want people to fully understand when I say those names, and we've talked about this many times, I'm talking about options only. I don't, I don't care whether it's Peloton or, or Snowflake or whatever. I am just not interested in being involved in the stocks themselves. I'd rather have much more control and be able to put on a call or put on a call spread or even maybe on the put side of it. As a matter of fact, Believe it or not, in, in, in ARC today, somebody had a very good trade that they were taking off on the puts because that, that, that particular entity has taken a pretty decent hit in the month of July. So it gave them a chance to roll out of that and actually go a little bit lower. Now, right now, that trade actually tur turns out to be very smart because even though they rolled it, they were selling the much more expensive put, the 114 puts, and buying the 105 puts. So taking off the bigger end of things and then still wanting to be there in case we get a little bit more of a pullback with some of those stocks that are those innovation stocks that we're talking about here. But I do think that we're going to continue to see the wild ride. And especially when we talk about volatility, which we hadn't yet, 22, 23 volatility index, that tells you that things are starting to look a little bit differently, I think, right now than they were. We've in the past, we have bounced over 20. We've immediately recoiled back. But now we're seeing the VIX, at least so far today, a couple hours in, where the VIX is still holding above 20. And it seems like it feels like it wants to billow up even a little bit more, especially if we continue on this downward path that we've had. By the way, 800 today. Let's add the 300 to Friday. This is a pretty significant couple of days yeah. to the downside in the markets. I'm noticing. I mean, what, what did we just show? The VIX was up 40 percent in, in a week. Yeah. yeah. So, but, Pete, you've got you bought calls today in, in lows in Nokia, in Snap, and in Under Armour. Yeah, I think that there are, whenever we see the unusual option activity, regardless of the market itself, you know, you try, you're trying to look and see how you want to navigate around a lot of those various uh, areas in the marketplace. So I, I look at some of these names and I think there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity. I'll give you one, as a matter of fact, right, right now today, tractor supply. I'm not in there. I've been in there in the past. But that's when you look at those numbers, and I know Bob Pisani put out a really good piece. He was talking about the fact that the P.E. levels are trading where they are, which seem to be very high. But I will tell you this. I look at that stock. I've been in many of their stores. I know it very well. Not as good as Jim, Farmer Jim, <laughs> but I know it pretty well. And I will tell you this. I think that's a name that on this sell off. That's one of these things where we always say creates an opportunity. Why would that stock get beat up the way it did? Well, because the P.E. is trading here. The, all of that does make some sense. I think this is a company that can continue to put out those kind of numbers. So maybe the P.E. at a 24, much like Apple, 
isn't nearly as stretched as everybody wants to say that it is because I think their earnings going forward are going to be that strong. See, this is one of the key questions, Pete, and tractor mm. supply is a good example of it, um, whether this rolling correction that we've seen is making certain stocks more attractive or whether it is signaling that there might be more pain in the near future. Our Mike Santoli, our senior markets reporter, our commentator, is uh, taking a look at that. And that's a real question now, Mike, right? At whether this rolling yeah. correction is making things more attractive that Pete is noticing, along with some others on the committee, or if it's time to batten down the hatches because things could get worse. Right. Well, the, this idea of a rolling correction or just really the really poor breath that we've been observing for weeks in the market, usually that sort of puts you on alert for the fact that it could reach the headline indexes. And that seems to be what's going on right now. It's probably better, though, than what you had at January uh, of 2018, where everything peaked at once. Everyone thought, you know, all inclusive rally and it was going to be upside from there. And it really was a very sharp kind of guillotine pullback uh, that we saw in the market. This seems to be something a little more like the market's been chewing over for some time. So, yes, you're seeing things like home builders get a bid today. Home builders, transports, energy, banks, uh, all of them more than 10 percent below their highs coming into today. So the market has already been on alert for this sort of thing. Um, and yes, yeah, small caps, as Joe mentioned, is probably close to that category as well. The, the tricky part is it would look exactly the same today if this were the start of a much deeper S&P 500 correction or if we're just going to tag the 50 day moving average as we did this morning in the S&P, of which we have multiple times this year and bounce right off it. Uh, so I, I think that's why you have to be a little bit uh, humble about saying, I know which way this goes from here. But it's probably better that we're pre-sold, that half the stocks in the S&P already down more than 10 percent from their high coming into today. So does that all send a really ugly message about the economy? That's unclear. To me, it's about where are we seeing stress pop up or are we seeing it pop up in things like credit? Not really. Things have worsened a little bit in terms of high yield spreads, but that's mostly because treasuries are rallying so much. You can certainly foresee a moment where we say, as you kind of were alluding to before, OK, 10 year at one point two real yields are that much more negative than they were before. Um, it seems like we have more of a dividend cushion uh, in stocks and you can do what you want with the discounting. I look at something like ARC. Uh, being green today, though, and say, look, people have been shorted. You're kind of pulling in risk all all around. That also means the stuff that's been beaten up a lot is going to get a bid. It's still down 25 percent from the highs. Mm -hmm. So all that stuff, I think we're churning through right now. The Dow's down 850 um, right now. So how, given what you just said, how critical now are the FANG stocks to, to hold up? Because if you have underlying weakness and then you pull the floor out, which is holding yeah. up a lot of weight, and then you lose that, where do you go? It depends what you want. Do you want the S&P 500 to be just propped up by a handful of stocks so that if you're an index fund holder, you don't have a drawdown? Or do you want people to actually surrender and have some kind of a flush to the downside and people have a reset across the market? Yeah, everybody uh, says they that want that, but the they end, never do. Not they the beginning of a rolling curve. Everybody says they want that, but when it actually happens, right. they never want that. Well, exactly. And so you see that on display right now. We're three percent from the high and we're talking about, you know, how bad is it going to get? Yeah. Um, and, and the other side yeah. of it, of course, is, you know, people who think that this is all just a bunch of noise. Right. Surratt, fun, Tom Lee says this is all going to be a great setup for a, for a second half rally. We, we don't expect this period of chop to lead to a larger 10 percent like decline for markets. He says, Surratt, a lot of people listen to what Tom uh -huh. Lee has to say yeah and Tom, Tom Tom's been right for a long time and and you know look markets are it's a pendulum right and if it goes to 10 but I believe uh, you know what Tom Lee's saying and, and I agree with him that I think the future is going to be much better than what we have now and all this choppiness we're getting if you see through it there are strong fundamentals and you, you do have good balance sheets and do you have a good consumer and we're going to get hiccups with the, the variant we, we know we were going to do that it's just all coming from the center and, and over time, pick your spots and put money back into the market when, when you're comfortable. But if you can't live with this volatility like today, then you know, that, that should say something to some, some investors it, it, that uh, maybe it's time to take some money off. Even Mike Santoli, if this is as good as it gets, I mean, so what? Why do you have to live at the mountaintop for, for the rest of your life, right? I mean, if, so we may not do a level of, of GDP growth yeah. that, that matches what we're doing now. It doesn't mean you're falling off a cliff. You're just going to a lower peak of, of, no, of right. on the same mountain range. 
Right. And, and it's just a matter of what you pay for it. And, uh, you know, this, the most cyclical stocks in the market, which probably mm. had the greatest embedded expectation of, you know, this, that this acceleration was going to go a lot farther, have already had, you know, these discounts created. in them. I'm saying discounts from their highs, not necessarily super cheap PEs. But, yeah, that's usually what happens here, right? Year two after a huge major low like we had last year, you find excuses to where you have to uh, have some payback. And, that, and that's probably what's been going on, again, uh, beneath the surface for, for some time right now. So it's not just binary, like either times are good or times are bad. It's always going to be, you know, shades of gray. I do think there is some so realization here, and maybe not a welcome one, that we thought we had a little more runway, you know, until you got to the fall and winter. Uh, and now it just seems as if, you know, with, with the global uh, caseloads going up and people worrying about exactly what that means, there's a feeling out there. There's a PTSD in traders like, OK, maybe we're back in it. And we don't really have to be back in it. It just has to be an adjustment in repricing for a slightly slower cadence if that's what we're going to get. There's always PTSD around everything. The first time there's a mini crisis feeling event, we all have the same feelings about the next 08. It, it's the same sort of thing, right? Once, once you've experienced the level of turbulence and, and terrible feeling that you have as an investor and a market participant, it just doesn't take that much to bring you all that, that way back to, to having those feelings. Mike, I appreciate your, uh, yep. your insights uh, on this as well. Should let you know that we do have a big interview coming up tomorrow. We have a halftime exclusive interview with Lee Cooperman. Uh, remember, we had mentioned him last week. He was watching the program. He emailed. He said, hey, I have a lot to say. Um, I'd like to come on. So Lee is coming on uh, tomorrow, and I couldn't think of a better time. Also, Rick Reeder is going to join us as well. Uh, it's so great to hear from both of them. You're going to get great stock perspective, and you're certainly going to get great overall market bond perspective. What's happening with yields, again, touching 118 on the 10-year today, bouncing off that a little bit. But stocks remain under significant pressure. We're back right after this. We'll have more trades ahead for you in this sell-off. Pete's got unusual activity. We've got new details out on Robin Hood's upcoming IPO. We'll do it all in two minutes. You got to take a listen to this. It's Squawk Pod. That's right. CNBC's flagship business news show is a podcast, Squawk Pod. And this is CNBC Control 2. It is not just the show, folks. It might be even better because uh, it's only audio. Join me, Katie Kramer, as I take you inside the Squawk Box control room and beyond the headlines of our TV broadcast with Joe Kernan, Becky Quick, and Andrew Ross Sorkin every weekday. Rolava. Subscribe to Squawk Pod on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. I'm Rahel Solomon, and here is our CNBC News update at this hour. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland formally prohibiting nearly all seizures of journalists' records for investigations into leaks of classified information. The move reverses years of Justice Department policy. Shares of PG&E falling to their lowest level of the year as the company reports that its equipment may have helped start the Dixie Fire that's burning in the Sierra Nevadas. It has burned more than 18,000 acres and is only 15 percent contained. Haiti's interim prime minister, Claude Joseph, is stepping down. Joseph has been leading the country since the assassination of President Jovenel Moise. Ariel Henry will take over for Joseph. Moise appointed Henry to be prime minister two days before he was killed. And on the news, forming new leadership and easing political tensions in Haiti. That's tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern. You're now up to date. Scott, I'll send it back to All you. Rahel, appreciate it. Rahel Solomon. All right, Pete, I just tweeted out, whoa, you're buying a stock and everybody's going to want to know about it. And it's one of the fangs that we don't talk about that much anymore. Netflix, why did right, you just buy because, it? Yeah, well, because it hit the pause button, Scott. It's been at the pause button all year. But I do think that this is a stock that has a, has a, a lot of room to the upside still. When I, when I look at Disney trading with a 50 multiple on a, a presently and a 40 in terms of when you look uh, forward, and then you look over at Netflix and it's trading somewhere not that terribly far away from the same valuation, I start to get pretty interested in Netflix. I think Netflix has, has made a lot of interesting moves of late. The most recent one that everybody's talking about now is this gaming and the cloud gaming platform that they're going to come out with. 
not right away, but it's going to be out there in the not too distant future. But when I look at this company, I look at the growth internationally, and I think that they're doing an unbelievable job here still in North America. They've had some great quarters and some some weaker quarters. We're going to find out tomorrow. Uh, we've got earnings coming up, and I think it's going to be very interesting. Volatility is really high, and it's something that I always mention to Patty, the producer. I don't usually look for stocks until I see hard sell-offs in the market. And this is a stock where we'd had a lot of call buying just in the last week or so. Monstrous call buying in here. Stock was trading about 560. It pulled back a little bit with the rest of the markets, not as much as, as other parts of the market, but significantly. And I thought that was a great opportunity to buy the stock and then use that implied volatility that is so high right now to be able to sell options against it. So that's exactly what I've done. I like this stock. I think that there is possibilities. Now, we might have a quarter that they report that might actually get sold off a little bit. In that case, I'm probably prepared to buy a little bit more, as long as the sell-off is for the right reasons. And, and, if, and we'll see. So it depends on what they say in their earnings report. But I like this company. I think they've done an amazing job. I think Reed, Reed Hastings always seems to have a handle on what the next level is. That's why I put him in that category with the Satya Nadellas and, and Brian Cornells and all those that are always looking out into the future. I think he's looking out into the future like the rest of them, and gaming is the place to be, just like Satya Nadella just recently put out with what they're doing in the gaming side with Microsoft. I knew you had to mention your Mount Rushmore of, of, of CEOs. I, I'm glad you didn't forget <laughs> any. a couple of them. <laughs> yeah, just, just a few. Uh, should let you know, uh, you know, not funny, the, the, the Dow just recently touched session lows uh, was down about 877, 878 around that level. So we continue to watch that. We're obviously keeping an eye on bond yields, too, as I look over here to see uh, the treasuries right now. The 10 years at 120. But remember, it was at 118. So that's got a, uh, people feeling a bit uneasy as well about where everything is trading today. Joe, tell me about this Bungie move that you made. You bought bought Bungie again. I tried, you know, listen, you're, you're exploring opportunities and you're looking in the places where we're seeing these rolling corrections and you're down 10 plus percent. That's where you're going to find the opportunity, I suspect. Uh, one could say, well, you only phone, found one name. Unfortunately, that's correct. There's only one name I'm willing to buy today. That's Bungie. It's agriculture related. I was in it previously, sold out of it in the upper 80s, back in here as it approaches its 200 day moving average. Uh, so I'll take a little bit of a position there. I wish I could find more opportunities. Uh, but as I said before, I just think we're set up this week where we're going to see more selling pressure in a lot of different places. All right. Well, Robinhood is releasing new details about its upcoming IPO. Our Leslie Picker following the money from the New York Stock Exchange for us. Leslie. Hey, Scott, that's right. Robinhood is planning to list its shares next week. But before it does, the company will embark on a roadshow hawking stock to investors. In its IPO, the company is asking for a market cap as high as $35 billion, about 36 times last year's revenue. But of course, trading activity has skyrocketed in the first half of this year, propelling the number of net cumulative funded accounts on the platform to two. 22 and a half million. Now that fervent activity is contributing to the company's new estimates that it raked in as much as $574 million on the top line in the second quarter. But Robin Hood also noting that it could face a slowdown in this current quarter thanks to quote decreased levels of trading activity, particularly in cryptocurrencies. Now Robin Hood itself will be selling 95% of this multi-billion dollar IPO with selling shareholders, including the two co-founders looking to cash in as well. As for the buyers, well, Robinhood is allocating as much as 35% of the deal to retail investors through its so-called IPO access platform. That would be a far higher proportion than is typical for retail allocation. Now, the company intends to list on the NASDAQ under the symbol H-O-O-D. Scott. You know, I was going to ask you, Leslie, about the, the maybe it's the most principal risk involved in, in this story is what happens if retail pulls back mm -hmm. in their investing and trading activity. That seems to be That's the number one risk for a company like Robinhood. And I think it's one that you should expect a bit of volatility with this company, given the nature of the ebbs and flows of trading activity, which is how they make the bulk of their money. They sell the order flow to, uh, you know, market makers like Citadel and others who are buying it, payment for order flow. We've talked about it a lot on this show and on this network as a whole. Uh, but certainly this year they saw a huge boom from that activity. It's unclear whether that continues into the future and the fact that they know that they're expecting a decline in trading activity in the third quarter and, and potentially into the second half of the year. Uh, you know, that is something that investors are going to have to reckon with, especially yeah. with this multiple, which is 
by most measures a growth multiple. Yeah, we, speaking of investors, Les, we happened to notice a tweet from one of our own, Steve Weiss, who said, quote, I cannot wait to short Robinhood depending on price. There's the tweet. Now, here's the Weiss. Uh, he's on the phone, I, I believe. <laughs> Steve Weiss, you want to tell us? Yes, Scott. Tell us about this. Sure. Well, first of all, I'm operating under two premises here. The first being that 2021, the beginning of it, is as good as it gets. And if you look at their model going backwards since inception 2013, they've had negative levers. So what I mean by that is the more trading cash they brought onto the platform, the more money they've lost. Those are in, that, in businesses I'd like to invest in. But the principal risk here is not a slowdown. The principal risk is Gary Gensler coming out and saying he's the new chair of the SEC, saying we're not going to allow payment for order flow or we're going to significantly curtail it. And he said on June 9th in a statement, he said, and let me quote this, as this is in reference to payment for order flow specifically to Robinhood. As a result, many Robinhood customers shouldered, shouldered the cost of inferior executions. These costs might have exceeded any savings they might have thought they'd gotten from zero commission trading. Robinhood was fined and it's been sanctioned so they can't do certain things. So, look, this company is supposedly all about the democratization of investing, yet you have the two founders who will only own 16% of the shares, yet control 65% of the vote. So what they say publicly about helping investors and doing everything for investors, if you go under the hood, it's actually against both investors and customers on the platform. Hmm. So if you're going to own a company like this that's for trading activity, own the regular ones, own Morgan Stanley, own Goldman Sachs. Don't own this. If the government does away, does away with payment for order flow, which is 81% of revenue, mm -hmm. then this company doesn't exist. Finally, Scott, they've got nearly 60 class action lawsuits against them. And I'd say some of those, based upon the fine they paid, stand a good chance of at least getting some recovery. So, look. I hear, I hear you, Weiss. I, I, I got you. I got you. Um, Leslie, you still with me? I'm still here. You want to just wrap it up? You want to address the, the concerns that, that Weiss brings up? And payment for order flow yeah. is, is a big one. And the prospect for higher regulation around it. Yeah, I think if you look at the risk factors, a lot of the times you see IPOs, they have kind of these boilerplate risk factors that seem kind of a far stretch from something that would actually happen. In the case of Robinhood, a lot of the risk factors as it pertains to regulation with payment for order flow and all of these other debates about the need to raise capital on an emergency basis, all of those are part of the risk factors. All of those are things we actually saw take place in real time, in real life, back in February uh, earlier this year. And so I think the risks are... At the forefront here, it'll be interesting to see how investors perceive them uh, throughout the marketing over the next week and a half or so. All right. We appreciate it. As always, Leslie, thank you, Leslie Picker. All right. Coming up, the big ETFs you need to watch today. And as we go to break, let's get a check on stocks right now. We're flirting with the lows of the day. We were approaching a 900 point loss for the Dow just moments ago. It's sitting down 877. That's a loss of two and a half percent. S&P under significant pressure today. NASDAQ, not quite as bad, but still down nearly 200 points in its own right. We're back right after this. You got to take a listen to this. It's Squawk Pod. That's right. CNBC's flagship business news show is a podcast, Squawk Pod. Hey, this is CNBC Control 2. It is not just the show, folks. It might be even better because uh, it's only audio. Join me, Katie Kramer, as I take you inside the Squawk Box control room and beyond the headlines of our TV broadcast with Joe Kernan, Becky Quick, and Andrew Ross Sorkin every weekday. Roll off of. Subscribe to Squawk Pod on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to the ETF Edge portion of Halftime Report. I'm Bob Pisani. Is long-term inflation a big issue or not? Let's ask, let's ask James Davolos. He's the man behind the Horizon Kinetics Inflation ETF, which invests in companies expected to benefit from inflation. And my old friend Tom Lydon from ETF Trends. Tom, I want to start with you. The markets are having a different problem than inflation today. Everyone wants to believe we're living in a post-COVID world, but the virus isn't going away. What ETFs are seeing the most activity today? Yeah, it seems like they're throwing the baby out with the bathwater uh, here, Bob. We're seeing uh, momentum, uh, high beta, quality, small cap, everything's uh, being sold today. However, a couple interesting points. 
The 20-year Treasury TLT is up 2%, seeing some nice, decent flows. And our friend Kathy Wood, actually ARKK, their flagship ETF, was actually up within the last hour. So lower rates, good for those aggressive stocks as well. And one key point, we've seen redemptions overall in commodity ETFs, but as mostly GLD, the flagship gold ETF. There are a lot of other ETFs in the commodity space that have done very well, up 20 or 30 percent. And those are really key to take a look at if this scare with the Delta virus does not affect lower prices. Yeah, and you see ARC there just dipping back into negative territory, but was positive. Now, James, for this new inflation ETF, how do you decide what stocks will benefit if inflation stays higher for longer? And what's the main stocks in it? Give us a two or three that are in this and what your thinking is. Sure. I think today indicates that this is going to be a very long, bumpy process of reflation into inflation. And you don't want to make a binary bet on inflation where you can impair a lot of capital. So we focus on companies that have hard asset exposure, which are going to benefit from inflationary forces, but operate capital light businesses. And by capital light, what I mean is minimal working capital, minimal balance sheet leverage, so they can compound through a full and uneven business cycle. Texas Pacific Land, for example, you own land, you own Archer's Daniel Midland, you own some precious metal companies. Exactly. So none of these companies are putting all the CapEx into the ground, into the asset themselves. They're benefiting with very high margins from the CapEx and from the operations of other companies operating in inflationary markets. Okay, thanks very much, James. Now, much more on how to play the inflation trade with James and Tom on ETF Edge, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. That's etfedge.cnbc.com. Halftime, back right after this. Give you another check. Uh, we just noted that the Dow was down by greater than 900 points. It's currently down about 918. That's a two and a third percent decline for the Dow Jones Industrial Average as fears over the Delta variant continue to spread throughout the markets. You see it not only in the major averages from a stock standpoint, but obviously in what yields are doing today as well, touching a low of 118 on the 10 year, bounced a little bit off of that, but not all that much. And that's your market picture at the moment. Pete has unusual activity. Pete, what do you see for us today? You know, it's interesting, Scott. I got two stocks that right now are in the green, which is amazing given the backdrop of what you were just saying. So Floor Corp is one of those stocks. The stock actually was trading right around 1475 at the time. And we had a nice size buyer, 11,000 of the January 17 and a half calls. They were going for about a buck 45, but going out in time, definitely unusual activity because everything's been very short term. Sticking with the short term, we're looking at August here, and I take a look at Fiber, uh, uh, FireEye, which is cybersecurity. I think this one's pretty interesting because it's on the lower end of its range. It's been in a tight range for a while, and it's been between 19 and 22, so it was trading about 1970 at the time, and a buyer of 10,000 of the August 21 calls. Fairly inexpensive. Those are going from anywhere from 50 cents up to about 60 cents. So I like the opportunities in both of these. I own both of these different stocks. All right. Appreciate that uh, very much, Pete. I should also let you know uh, IBM is reporting uh, after the bell today. One of our investment committee members on the program just made a move in that stock as well. We'll bring you up to date. We'll continue to follow the major market sell off. The Dow Jones Industrial Average down 928 points. We're back in two minutes. Mentioned we do have a move on IBM, and it comes from Michael Farr. Ahead of earnings, you sold it. Why? This is an old tech name, and I've just been patient with it for so long, I thought I could make better money in other things. You know, IBM's beaten earnings uh, estimates like 19 of the last 20 quarters, so it'll probably do fine. Just too slow a grower. I put my money where I thought I could make more money. Pete, you want to you tell him if he made the right move or not? I think he made the right move. I own it still, but I think he made the right move. Really? And I was I expecting you to say something the, different. I thought I set you up. Well, well, the big reason why I, why I loved this stock for the last couple of years and have owned it for the last couple of years, and to Mike's point, it hasn't produced very well, but I thought Whitehurst was the guy, and I thought he was going to be the uh, red hat and all of that put together and Whitehurst running it. That's obviously changed, and he's no longer there, so because of that, I probably have to reevaluate this one myself, and I'll wow. probably have to do it after earnings. Wow. Yeah. 
I'm surprised to hear you say that. Yes. You've been such a big backer of this stock. And, and, and the, the yes, cloud thing in the right was, the, was the, the principal reason. Yes, you're right. But Whitehurst isn't there. And I tell you what, sometimes is as much about the person, man or woman, who's sitting in that seat making those decisions. That's the important part. That's the element that changes things. Those are the guys who make all the changes, like Satya did at Microsoft and like so many others, have done such a magnificent job of coming in and taking over or been elevated and taking over. I just don't see that happening right now with uh, IBM. All right. You just make sure you tell me Absolutely. when you sell it, okay, Pete? Because that feels like that's what's <laughs> coming. Final trades are next. All right, we're back. We're going to do final trades in a moment. First, though, a reminder, Lee Cooperman with us tomorrow, along with Rick Reeder. So we'll have all of your market action covered. Those two gentlemen joining the investment committee, looking very much forward to the conversation we'll have then. All right, Liz, Friday was nasty. Today feels and looks worse. Leave us with some words of wisdom, a final trade, whatever you have to say to our viewers today. Yeah, I think the nastiness is overdone. My final trade is financials. Fundamentals are strong. I think I said earlier, the yield move is overdone. And when it comes back, it'll be a nice tailwind to do what I think Joe said earlier in the show and nibble on financials. All right, good stuff. It's great having you on the program. Uh, everybody else, quick, please. Michael Farr, quick. Uh, Raytheon, I like it in the industrials. Terra Nova says buy those on its 2.5% dividend. Like All right, Raytheon. So, Sarada, I need a name. Morgan Stanley, what oh. I said before. Okay, I Joe and then stuff. Pete. Market access. International game technology. All right, guys, good stuff. Thank you. You've been listening to CNBC's Halftime Report, the podcast. You can always catch us live weekdays at 12 Eastern, only on CNBC. You got to take a listen to this. It's Squawk Pod. That's right. CNBC's flagship business news show is a podcast, Squawk Pod. This is CNBC Control 2. It is not just the show, folks. It might be even better because uh, it's only audio. Join me, Katie Kramer, as I take you inside the Squawk Box control room and beyond the headlines of our TV broadcast with Joe Kernan, Becky Quick, and Andrew Ross Sorkin every weekday. Rolava. Subscribe to Squawk Pod on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts.